Sometime around 1600 BC, a thriving Bronze Age maritime civilization that we refer to as the Minoans ruled the island of Crete and the neighboring island of Santorini, also known as Thera. They thrived for many thousands of years until they hit a turning point around 1550 BC and within 100 years the civilization came to an abrupt and tragic decline. At this point in time, it's estimated that the Minoans had a population of 100,000 or more, with most of them mainly situated on the island of Crete, which was the civilization's home base. The Minoans had lived in and ruled this area and the surrounding Aegean islands since at least 7000 BC, when the first proper habitation occurred, which took shape as a pre-ceramic Neolithic farming community, though there are hominid remains that have been found that date back to 130,000 years ago. The Minoans were an incredible civilization that is shrouded in almost complete mystery. We only very recently rediscovered their existence in the 19th century and we don't actually know what they called themselves. The term Minoan was given to them in the mid 19th century by the British archaeologist Arthur Evans when excavations were being undertaken to discover the story of this once great civilization. In this video, we're going to cover the massive volcanic eruption that severely impacted the Minoans. It very well might have been the largest factor in their rapid decline, and it's possible that it set forth a chain of events that led to their eventual downfall. The Minoan volcanic eruption was so large that midway through the eruption, the magma chamber collapsed in on itself, spawning a mega tsunami with waves estimated to be up to 150 meters in height. This mega tsunami traveled directly towards the island of Crete, and with very little warning, it smashed directly into the capital city of the Minoans, causing untold damage and destroying vast quantities of valuable war and trade ships, along with cities and farmland, severely affecting the population and making the civilization vulnerable to an attack from an outside empire. This is the story of the Minoans and the Santorini volcanic eruption. The Minoans were an extremely advanced civilization. They built large and elaborate palaces up to four stories high featuring complicated plumbing systems and decorated with frescoes. The largest Minoan city is that of Gnosis, followed by Vastos, but the island of Crete has several archaeological sites as the Minoans were widespread on the island when their decline began. On Santorini, the Minoans had inhabited the entire island prior to the cataclysmic volcanic eruption that measured a 7 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, meaning it was as large and powerful as the Tambora eruption. This means it would have caused significant changes in the climate, along with an immense level of destruction when it had erupted. When Tambora erupted, it caused a famine that spread all across Europe, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people just from the ash cloud that was spawned and the sun-blocking aerosols that were released during the volcanic eruption. When the Minoans inhabited Santorini, the island actually looked quite similar to how it does in present day. The only difference where the island was an almost complete ring shape, with the only inlet being located in the southwest compared to the three large openings that exist today, and the caldera island that existed then, referred to as Precomeni, had almost 20,000 years to build up in size, and so it was quite large and almost stretched from one side of the harbour to the other. It was essentially a larger, more mature version of the two Kemeni islands that exist today. It's unknown if the Minoans knew that Santorini was actually a caldera left over from a once gigantic eruption, or if they knew it was still active in present day, because a lot of the evidence and depositions from past volcanic eruptions had been almost completely, if not completely eroded from the island by wind and rain when it was originally settled, and the only volcanic activity that had occurred up to the Minoan eruption was small effusive eruptions and fumaroles, which most likely made the Minoans think that the volcanic activity here was only minor at best. Unfortunately, they were very, very wrong. Santorini has been active for roughly 2 million years. Beginning around 200,000 years ago, the Santorini volcano took a violent turn. It started the cycle of mountain building, erupting, and violently collapsing into a caldera, after which it would repeat that cycle time and time again, meaning this type of eruption will almost certainly occur again in the future. 
The present day caldera is composed of overlapping shield volcanoes and is cut by at least four partially overlapping calderas, meaning the scale of destructivity witnessed during the Minoan eruption has occurred four times in the past 200,000 years. The actual Minoan eruption of the Santorini volcano is often split into four phases. Phase 1. The months leading up to the eruption. Thankfully, the Minoans that inhabited Santorini were given a warning of what was to come many months prior to the actual major eruption. A standard Plinian eruption initially occurred. It would have been similar to the recent Mount St. Helens eruption, minus the flank collapse, as it released a 10 km high pillar of ash and pumice and it exploded violently. The wind carried the ash plume in a southeasterly direction, blanketing the Akrotiri settlement that existed on Santorini. The town of Akrotiri was the main Minoan settlement on the Santorini island. With this eruption, it's thought that a large number of earthquakes occurred both prior to and after this event, as magma slowly rose up from the depths of the earth to form the main eruption that would occur only a few months after this event. It seems like either this eruption, or it and the associated earthquakes, led to a migration from the island, as no human remains have ever been found, and it seems like a mass evacuation occurred, as most possessions were taken along with the fleeing residents. This initial eruption occurred prior to winter rains, which eroded a lot of the ash and pumice released, leaving only a fine layer behind for geologists to study in present day. In the spring, the next phase would begin. Phase 2. The eruption begins. When the first major eruption started, it was initially characterised by a major magmatic explosion that literally blasted forth in a Plinian style from the pre kameni island. In doing so, it exposed the massive underlying magma chamber to the surrounding shallow marine embayment, and seawater began to flood into the chamber, mixing with the vast quantities of magma, and like a nuclear bomb, it would explode ferociously. A massive 30 to 35 km high eruption column was released, which reached the stratosphere as the volcano blew forth massive volcanic bombs, ash, pumice, and gigantic and deadly pyroclastic surges in all directions, literally sterilizing the surrounding Santorini Island, which would be buried in up to 70 meters worth of pumice by the end of the eruption. Any man-made structures that were not destroyed during the first phase of the eruption that occurred prior to winter were now completely destroyed and buried beneath metres of volcanic material. This eruption would completely bury the entire Akrotiri settlement and it would remain forgotten about until the 1900s when it was finally rediscovered in 1967. This phase of the eruption would occur for several hours as large sections of the Santorini Island would be blown apart from the force of the explosions. Smaller tsunami waves that were generated as a direct result of volcanic explosions are thought to have occurred, but these would be nothing compared to what was about to come next. Phase 3 and 4 Caldera Collapse and the Aftermath After several long and violent hours worth of eruptions, the large magma chamber beneath Santorini was rapidly emptying as more and more magma was blasted out into the surrounding island and sea. As the magma chamber emptied, it began to become unstable. Eventually, the magma chamber collapsed in upon itself, which would have been the climax of this unbelievably large eruption. This collapse caused a variety of extremely dangerous events to occur. Firstly, a large displacement of water occurred as the caldera collapsed in upon itself and, as a result, a mega tsunami up to 150 metres in height was spawned, along with perhaps the largest and most explosive eruption as the remaining magma inside of the magma chamber got forced out during the collapse in one big final squeeze. And when it mixed with water, what I can only imagine to be a cataclysmic sound echoed forth in the largest blast of the eruption changing the shape of the island to appear how it does in present day. But it didn't end there. The collapse generated a massive pyroclastic base surge, which spread outwards and covered the entire island and surrounding sea for a vast distance. And along with this, even lahars were generated. The tsunami that was created was sent in all directions, but it was on a direct collision course with the island of Crete. 
At that time, the capital of Crete, Gnosis, was located in the northern part of Crete, and the city itself was below 100 metres above sea level. So the largest tsunami waves were able to reach it, and the wave devastated a number of settlements on the island of Crete with a force strong enough to smash down buildings. It's my speculation that a large amount of war and trade ships that Crete used would have been located in the northern part of the island, near the capital, and I speculate that this tsunami wave would have decimated a large part of their naval fleet by pushing the boats into the city as the tsunami waves pushed into the island, similar to what happened during the 2011 earthquake and tsunami of Japan. The only difference is the waves that hit Crete were 110 meters higher than the 40 meter waves that devastated Japan. The ashfall and pumice deposits from the Minoan eruption are found all over the eastern Mediterranean, stretching as far as Turkey. The heaviest ashfall fell around the east and northeast of Santorini. Ash barely fell on Crete, and only did during the first phase when Santorini erupted in a standard Plinian fashion. It's worth mentioning that we don't know exactly what year this eruption occurred. The most recent estimate from a 2022 study shows that the Santorini eruption occurred between 1611 and 1538 BCE. The radiocarbon dates and the archaeological dates are in substantial disagreement, but one thing is certain, this eruption was one of the largest to have occurred since humans began their domination of the planet. That is certainly undisputed. After the eruption after this eruption, the Minoan civilization attempted to continue. It would be plagued by another large natural disaster in the mid-1400 BCE, and it's speculated that it was a major earthquake that occurred. This earthquake destroyed many cities and palaces. On top of this, the nearby Mycenaean Greeks began their harassment of the Minoans, and they would eventually conquer the entire island. They most likely saw the eruption and tsunami and ensuing earthquakes as an opportunity to take over this prosperous island and valuable trading route and claim it for themselves. At their height, the Minoans were a massive and advanced civilization that traded with all nearby civilizations such as the Egyptians. But within only 200 years, everything would change and their marked decline would begin. Eventually, their cities were razed and their culture would become incorporated into the other Hellenistic states, and they would be sadly forgotten about for the most part. The island of Santorini was forever changed, and was uninhabited for many hundreds of years following this eruption. The settlement of Akrotiri was forgotten about, and what was once a bustling trade route for copper ceased in a matter of hours, along with the beautifully paved streets, the extensive drainage system, and the production of high-quality pottery and further craft specialisations that point to the level of sophistication once achieved by the settlement. The Santorini volcano would remain seemingly dormant to the eye following the Minoan eruption. Beneath the ocean, deep within the earth, new magma was rising from the melting, subducting African plate and was beginning the process all over again as it slowly accumulated. In 197 BC, the next eruption occurred from the central vent, releasing Dacitic magma and creating a new island that we know today as Palia Kameni. These same characteristics would occur time and time again. In 1707, the island of Nia Kameni was born during an eruption. In present day, the entire island is populated and the residents are in danger of another eruption occurring at any time. But for many, it's well worth the risk to live in such a beautiful and idyllic Caldera Island. So this is the story of Santorini for now, until the next big one occurs. Krakatoa is an unbelievably dangerous volcano that exists in the Sunda Strait, between the islands of Java and Sumatra in the Indonesian province of Lampung. It has taken more lives than most volcanoes humans have encountered, only ever being surpassed by Mount Tambora, which, like Krakatoa, is also in Indonesia. In this video, we're going to take a look at Krakatoa's violent eruptions and the deadly sized tsunamis it has created, as well as when humans first started documenting their encounter with this force to be reckoned with. Krakatoa has taken on many forms in our short history of recording it, from a thriving, beautiful island to a fireland devoid of any life a few short months later. It's blown up into four different islands and has become an archipelago 
and its history is of sheer violence and constant unbridled destruction. In the past, eruptions have been so extreme that it's left the island in a state that would time and time again become unrecognisable to passing European ships. The name Krakatoa was first shown on western maps in 1611, but mankind's documented history of this volcanic anomaly goes way beyond that date. 416 AD the Javanese Book of Kings A thundering sound was heard from the mountain Batuara, which was answered by a similar noise from Capi, lying westward of the modern Bantam. Capi is the volcano that we in modern day refer to as Krakatoa. A great glowing fire which reached the sky came out of the last named mountain. The whole world was greatly shaken, and violent thundering, accompanied by heavy rain and storms took place. But not only did not this heavy rain extinguish the eruption of the fire of the mountain Capi, but augmented the fire. The noise was fearful. At last the mountain Capi, with a tremendous roar, burst into pieces and sank into the deepest of the earth. The water of the sea rose and inundated the land. The country to the east of the mountain Batuara, to the mountain Rajabasa, was inundated by the sea. The inhabitants of the northern part of the Sunda country, to the mountain Rajabasa, were drowned and swept away with all property. The water subsided, but the land on which Kapi stood became sea, and Java and Sumatra were divided into two parts. This is an incredible story. It basically means that Krakatoa along with the neighbouring volcano erupted simultaneously. Batuara in present day is called Pulisari. They most likely shared the same magma chamber. Krakatoa erupted with such force that when the magma chamber beneath the earth began to deplete, it caved in on itself and turned into a massive caldera, sparking an unbelievably powerful volcanic eruption and mega tsunami. The Santorini volcanic eruption that occurred between 15 and 16 BCE in the Mediterranean did just this, and it created a mega tsunami up to 150 meters high, which is roughly around 490 feet, and it's thought to be responsible for beginning the decline of the entire Minoan civilization. So when Krakatoa erupted in 416 AD, it destroyed the entire land bridge between Java and Sumatra, and an entire city and population looks to have been taken with it. The Global Climate Changes of 535 to 536 AD An eruption around this date was believed to have been even more violent than Krakatoa's 1883 eruption, which is, to this day, the second most destructive eruption in terms of fatalities. This eruption caused global climate changes, which caused unseasonal weather, crop failures and famines worldwide, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. February 1681. I saw with amazement that the island of Krakatoa on my first trip to Sumatra, which was on June 1679, being completely green and healthy with trees, now lay completely burned and barren in front of our eyes, and that at four locations was throwing up large chunks of fire. And when I asked the ship's captain when the aforementioned island had erupted, he told me that this happened in May of 1680. He showed me a piece of pumice as big as his fist. February 1780. The crews of HMS Resolution and HMS Discovery after Captain James Cook's death in Hawaii stopped for a few days on Krakatoa. They found a freshwater and hot water spring on the island, and they described the natives who then lived on the island as friendly and made several sketches. September 8, 1832. US warship Peacock anchored off the north end. Springs boiling furiously up through many fathoms of water were found on the eastern side of Krakatoa. The boat glided over crystal clear water over an extensive and highly beautiful submarine garden. Corals of every shape and hue were there, some resembling sunflowers and mushrooms, others cabbage from an inch to three feet in diameter, while a third type bore a striking likeness to a rose. The hillsides were typical of tropical climate. Large flocks of parrots, monkeys in great variety, wild mango and orange groves, a superb scene of plants and flowers of every description glowing in vivid tints of purple, red, blue, brown and green, but not water or provisions. 1883 Eruption Seismic activity around the volcano was intense in the years preceding the disastrous 1883 eruption. A series of lesser eruptions began on the 20th of May 1883. The volcano released huge plumes of steam and ash, lasting until late August. 
On the 27th of August, a series of four huge explosions almost entirely destroyed the island. The explosions were so violent that they were heard 3,110 kilometers, which is 1,930 miles away, in Perth in Western Australia. It was also heard in the island of Rodriguez near Mauritius, 4,800 kilometers away, which is absolutely mind-blowing. The, pre the wave rounded the globe three and a half times, and ash was propelled to a height of 80 kilometers. The sound of the eruption was so loud, it was reported that if anyone was within 16 kilometers, they would have gone deaf. The 1883 eruption, eruption was equivalent to 200 megatons of TNT, about 13,000 times the nuclear yield of the Little Boy bomb, which was 3 to 16 kilotons in comparison, and that devastated Hiroshima during World War II. But it also surpassed the yield of Saar Bomber, and was four times stronger than it. The Saar Bomber is to this day the most powerful nuclear device ever detonated at 50 megatons. The combined effects of pyroclastic flows, volcanic ash, and tsunamis had disastrous results both in the region and worldwide. There are numerous documented reports of groups of human skeletons floating across the Indian Ocean on rafts of volcanic pumice, with some washing up on the east coast of Africa up to a year after the eruption. Average global temperatures were also impacted, and they fell by as much as 1.2 degrees Celsius in the year following the eruption. Weather patterns continued to be chaotic for years, and temperatures did not reach to normal until 1888. People have suggested that Edvard Munch's famous 1893 painting, The Scream, depicts the colour of the sky over Norway after the eruption, with it being blood red. The Child of Krakatoa, 1927 Volcanic Explosivity Index of 3 On the 29th of December in 1927, a new island rose above the waterline. The eruptions were initially of pumice and ash, and that island and the two islands that followed were quickly eroded away by the sea. Eventually, a fourth island named Anak Krakatoa, meaning Child of Krakatoa in Malay and Indonesian, broke water in August 1930 and produced lava flows more quickly than the waves could erode them. Krakatoa has returned. During all of the 20th century and into the 21st century up to present day, Krakatoa erupted consistently. These eruptions were nowhere near as strong as previous eruptions, but it was incredibly volcanically active. In the months leading up to the 2018 tsunami, Anak Krakatoa had seen increased activity. By this point, Anak Krakatoa had grown to a considerable size. And on the 21st of December, it erupted again, lasting more than two minutes and producing an ash cloud 400 meters high. On the 22nd of December, from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. local time, a total of 423 eruptions were recorded. The danger level of the volcano was increased to level two. Authorities warned people not to conduct any activities within two kilometers of the volcano. A few hours later, at 11 p.m. local time, and that Krakatoa erupted and damaged local seismographic equipment, though a nearby seismographic station detected continuous tremors. The eruption caused the collapse of the southwest portion of the volcano, which triggered a hectares or 160 acres of the volcano had collapsed into the ocean at one time. The collapse caused the height of the volcano to be reduced from 338 to 110 meters. At least 426 people were killed and 14,000 were injured. At 11.27 p.m., 24 minutes after the eruption, a tsunami was detected. There wasn't enough time to warn everyone, and it struck. Dozens of buildings were destroyed by the wave in Lampung and Banton three minutes later, causing untold damage and taking people by complete surprise. The tsunami struck the coast of Banton and Lampung with a height of 13 meters or 43 feet, and it struck about 312 kilometers of the coastline varying in height from 2 meters to 5 meters or more in other places. 150 billion rupiah, or a little over 10 and a half million US dollars in damages, was estimated in just one Indonesian village alone. 202 billion rupiah was reported from the government of South Lampung, or a little over 14 million US dollars. The damage was unbelievable. Whole towns were uplifted and pushed inland from the strength of the waves. Only three months prior, another tsunami had struck Indonesia in September of 2018. The fishery industry of East Java has significantly declined, with fishermen refusing to go out on boats, and I don't blame them. 
And along with this, the tourist industry has taken a significant blow. 90% of reservations were cancelled due to the tsunami. Its legacy continues. A massive eruption occurred on the 26th of December, and the sound of the eruption was noticeably heard by residents in surrounding islands. Most people compared the sound of the eruption to a bomb blast or gas tank explosion. And on the 27th of December, the status of the volcano was raised to a level 3, which is the second highest danger level. Residents were not allowed to conduct any activities within 5 kilometers of the volcano. Krakatoa isn't through. It's still active to the tiny extent that we were used to in the past century prior to this eruption, and it's preparing for its next major eruption with every second that passes. And so it waits, rebuilding its strength, to release its power once more, one day. I only hope that the next time it does, humans are more technologically resilient to be able to mitigate the damage, or else a repeat of not only 2018, but of 1883, or more scarily, of the 416 AD eruption could happen. So if another event at either scale occurs, the death toll could be in the millions. My thoughts go out to anyone who lost a loved one or their town in a 2018 eruption. I hope you see a brighter day. In the heart of the Indonesian archipelago, on the serene island of Sumbawa, the towering peak of Mount Tambora stood as a sentinel. Its majestic height often obscured by a veil of clouds. Its lower slopes, rich and fertile, were home to the Tambora tribe, a community deeply rooted in tradition and harmony with nature. They cultivated their lands, fished in the sapphire waters, and reveled in the rhythm of life that had persisted for generations. In this video, we're going to cover the notorious 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora. Welcome to Oz Geographics. Beneath this picture of tranquility, the earth whispered of a brewing tempest. The mountain, which had stood silent for centuries, was about to unveil a story of fire and fury. Deep within its bowels, the magma chamber told a tale of tension and turmoil. Over time, the magma had cooled to a near crystalline state, growing increasingly viscous and trapping gas bubbles that yearned to break free. This heightened viscosity was a consequence of the magma's temperature, cooler than what one might expect from such a behemoth but periodic injections of fresh magma from the depths disturbed this almost solid state and kept it fluidic, ensuing the chamber remained active, teeming with energy and potential. As days turned into nights and seasons ebbed and flowed, the island's inhabitants remained blissfully unaware of the geological drama unfolding beneath their feet. But in 1815, nature's patience wore thin. The pressure within the magma chamber, a ticking time bomb of pent up energy, reached its breaking point. The once majestic Mount Tambora roared to life in a cataclysmic display of power, casting aside its cloak of serenity. The eruption was nothing short of apocalyptic. A colossal plume of ash and smoke ascended into the heavens, blocking out the sun and casting a shadow of uncertainty over the world below. The violent release gave birth to pyroclastic flows, avalanches of scalding gas and rock that consumed everything in its path. The Tambora tribe, the guardians of the mountain, faced the full wrath of this eruption. Their villages, a tapestry of life and culture, were buried in moments, echoing the tragic fate of Pompeii centuries earlier. But Tambora's voice was not confined to Sumbawa. Its echoes reverberated across the globe. The eruption spewed an unimaginable volume of ash and tens of millions of tons of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. These particles, high in the stratosphere, formed a dark shroud that dimmed the sun's rays, giving birth to the infamous Year Without a Summer in 1816. Across continents, crops withered and temperatures plunged. Economies faltered as grain prices skyrocketed and livestock perished. The world, bound together by this volcanic event, faced food riots, disease outbreaks and a palpable sense of despair. Yet even in the darkest hours, the indomitable spirit of humanity shone through. Faced with adversity, innovation blossomed. The scarcity of horse fodder birthed the dray scene, a precursor to the modern bicycle. Writers and artists, inspired by the gloomy skies and societal upheavals, birthed timeless masterpieces, with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein standing as a testament to the era's tumultuous emotions. In the aftermath of the eruption, the once verdant island of Sumbawa transformed into a desolate, ashen landscape. The sun's rays struggled to pierce the thick veil of ash, casting a muted, eerie glow over the ruins. The cries of the Tambora tribe, who had once sung songs of harvest and joy, were replaced by a haunting silence broken only by the occasional whisper of wind carrying tales of a bygone era. 
Yet, even as the world grappled with the magnitude of the disaster, nature began its slow process of healing and renewal. From the depths of destruction emerged tendrils of hope. The ash, rich in minerals, gradually enriched the soil, and the first signs of green began to pierce the grey blanket. Birds, which had fled the volcanic fury, began their return, their songs heralding a new beginning. The survivors of the Tambora tribe, though scarred by memories of that fateful day, were resilient. They regrouped, sharing stories of survival and loss, and began the arduous task of rebuilding their lives. New villages were established, further from the ominous shadow of Tambora. The tales of the eruption, passed down through oral traditions, served as both a memorial to those who perished and a cautionary tale for future generations. Elsewhere in the world, societies adapted and evolved. The global cooling catalyzed discussions about climate and weather patterns, sparking early interest in meteorology and earth sciences. The challenges of the year without a summer prompted communities to develop better agricultural practices and food storage solutions, laying the groundwork for advancements in agronomy. As decades turned into centuries, the story of Mount Tambora, while fading from immediate memory, found its place in the annals of history and science. Researchers and explorers drawn by the tales of the eruption began to study the mountain, unearthing clues about its past and the forces that had led to the cataclysmic event. The excavations around the region revealed remnants of the Tambora tribe civilization, preserved in volcanic ash, offering valuable insights into their way of life. The legacy of the Tambor eruption serves as a testament to the cyclical nature of life, of destruction and creation, of endings and new beginnings. It stands as a humbling reminder of nature's might and the intricate balance that exists between our planet and its inhabitants. And as the modern world faces its own set of challenges, the tales from Tambora echo a timeless message of resilience, adaptation and the indomitable spirit of humanity in the face of overwhelming odds. Thanks for watching. In the annals of natural history, few events have imprinted themselves upon the collective memory of humanity as indelibly as the catastrophic eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815. This was not a tragedy confined to the realm of fiery mountaintops and ash-covered villages, but a profound disturbance that would ripple through the climatic systems of the world, bringing with it a year of darkness, a year without a summer. As the earth shook and the skies darkened, the magnitude of this volcanic fury was felt not just in the immediate devastation on the Indonesian island of Sumbawa, but also in the far-flung corners of the globe where the sun was obscured and the crops failed. The year 1816 entered history books with a notorious epithet, witnessing a climate anomaly that disrupted the rhythm of the seasons and brought humanity face to face with the fragility of its existence. This was a period marked by agricultural catastrophe, widespread famine, and the stirrings of scientific curiosity, an epoch where the capriciousness of nature's might was met with human despair and resilience in equal measure. From the ashen aftermath of one of the most potent volcanic eruptions recorded, a narrative unfolds. A narrative of a world plunged into a volcanic winter, of societies grappling with the precarity of food security, and of the remarkable human responses to environmental crises. This is a story of how a mountain's wrath reshaped the world, of the lives it touched, and the legacies it forged in its icy embrace. It is a tale woven through with the threads of tragedy and triumph, darkness and enlightenment, and above all, the enduring human spirit's capacity to adapt and to overcome. In this video, we'll continue on from yesterday's episode on the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora, link in the description, and we'll look at the volcanic winter that resulted from it, which produced the 1816 year without a summer. In 1815, the world experienced a natural catastrophe of unprecedented scale when Mount Tambora in the Dutch East Indies erupted with an apocalyptic force. It was a cataclysm that would etch itself into the annals of history, not just for the immediate horror it unleashed, but for the prolonged darkness that followed. The eruption, which occurred on April 10, 1815, was the most powerful in recorded history. The mountain spewed forth an estimated 100 cubic kilometers of debris, ash, and sulfuric acid droplets into the atmosphere. The immediate vicinity was devastated. Pyroclastic flows engulfed the surrounding landscape, and ash blanketed the land, destroying agricultural prospects. Around 10,000 local inhabitants were killed in the immediate aftermath of the eruption, and the island of Sumbawa bore the full brunt of the tragedy, with its communities decimated and its fields rendered barren. But the horror of the eruption was not confined to Sumbawa or even the Dutch East Indies. The true extent of Tambora's wrath would manifest in the following year, 1816. 
known as the year without a summer. The ash and sulfuric acid that had been injected into the stratosphere encircled the globe, forming an aerosol veil that dimmed the sun's warmth and altered weather patterns. In North America and Europe, the summer of 1816 was marked by cold temperatures and incessant rains, resulting in failed harvests and a subsistence crisis. Snow fell in June, and frost persisted through the summer months, an aberration that left crops withered and the ground barren. In New England, farmers faced the sight of milk freezing in their pails. The Canadian Maritimes experienced heavy frost and ice in the midst of what should have been warm seasons, leading to widespread crop failures. Across the Atlantic, the people of Europe suffered similar fates. Crop failures in Ireland, Wales and England led to what has been called the last great famine of the Western world. Grain prices soared as scarcity gripped the continent. Families found themselves tearing apart their own homes to scavenge for wood to keep warm through the unseasonably cold summer months. The poor, unable to afford the exorbitant prices of grain, resorted to eating nettles and roots to survive. The total number of lives lost as a consequence of the eruption and its aftermath is difficult to ascertain with precision, but it is clear that the indirect effects of the volcanic winter caused by Mount Tambora claimed tens of thousands of lives, if not more. The famine and disease that followed in its wake, the inevitable attendance to hunger and malnutrition swept across the globe in a grim reaper's dance of death. Yet from this period of darkness there arose beacons of creativity and scientific inquiry. The dreary summer of 1816 confined a group of British writers in a villa by Lake Geneva, where Mary Shelley conceived her novel Frankenstein, a work that reflected the bleak and turbulent mood of the times. Likewise, the climatic anomalies piqued the interest of the scientific community and contributed to the nascent field of climate science. The volcanic winter of Mount Tambora serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance of our climate system and the profound effects that natural events can have on human civilization. It underscores the vulnerability of our societies to the whims of the Earth's geophysical processes and stands as a testament to the resilience and adaptability of humanity in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges. Thanks for watching.